Okay, so I think it's time to start. Uh, I'd like to uh, start by uh, you welcome to uh, our uh, scientific advisory committee members. So we have two in person and uh, one is with us uh, via Skype. So that's uh, Kurt Kallam. Can you hear me? Kurt. Well, maybe he's not with us anymore. Anyway, uh, we're going to start by So we'll start with this, uh, I will start with giving a presentation here for about 40 minutes, half an hour to 40 minutes about uh, the Institute, our setup here, and uh, how things have been developing since we started here. Um, we will then continue with uh, some uh, presentations of the research groups, the main research groups here, by uh, members of our faculty. We'll take a short break, and then we will have a discussion with some uh, with the faculty and some board members this afternoon and then uh, the plan is to have uh, more of the committee uh, with us via Skype again. Okay, but um, the uh, let me just start with uh, a few general words about uh, what uh, we view as Nodita's mission. These are taken from some strategy documents that we have released over, over the years. And so our overriding uh, mission is, of course, to do uh, first-rate research. Uh, we then have uh, also, of course, as our mission is to, this is a Nordic Institute, and we want to build on and build up uh, Nordic capabilities in theoretical physics. Uh, Nodita has a history of being important in uh, promoting new emergent areas in physics. And maybe the best example is uh, that Nodita played an instrumental role in, in uh, the introduction of astrophysics in the Nordic countries in the 70s and early build up of that. Uh, later examples would include biological physics and complex systems. I think it's very important that we have eye on, on, on this role. Uh, another thing that Nodita tries to achieve through its operations is to bring together, uh, the Nordic countries are, are fairly small, the research groups are spread out, and we like to help as much as we can in bringing together people to get the critical mass, if you like, in, in, in specialized areas. And this can be both in, in terms of research, but also in terms of advanced courses and, and, and research training. Um, and then, I guess I, that was my last point here, so we'll move to the next slide. Now, in order to achieve these goals, we have to make sure that at all times the Institute remains flexible, uh, is ready to move in a new direction, as they, and, and, and sees opportunities as they present themselves. Uh, it has to be, if it wants to, if we want to operate at the uh, level of research that we aspire to, we have to remain attractive to good researchers at all levels, both senior uh, researchers, but also the uh, more junior, down to postdoctoral and graduate student level. Now, we are a Nordic Institute, and as such, we have to make sure that we stay relevant to our, our community, so we should keep a healthy focus on the local environment, but of course, that not, should not be to the exclusion of, of us. Of, 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 you know, the physics should, of course, come first for the regional issues. But in order to have any of these, we need to be stable, both organizationally and, and financially. And this, in recent years, of course, has not been clear. I think things are stabilizing, but we still have some a, a way to go to, to sort of see in front of us a, a, a 
here and then steadily up. Okay. Now we have been investing a lot of our resources in recent years in, in, in uh, what we call scientific programs and, and workshops uh, of various types. And I think this is uh, a very appropriate for an institute like Nodita because this uh, notion that um, of collaboration has been clear, of course, for a while in, in, in experimental subjects. But I think in theory also is becoming more and more appreciated that uh, collaboration uh, is, is, is key. And uh, we are, this is witnessed by the many program uh, type centers that are, uh, are being run around the world. We have, of course, the ITP in Santa Barbara, around longest maybe. We have the Isaac Newton, Newton Institute, the uh, Galileo Institute, uh, Institute for Nuclear Theory. These last two are, of course, perhaps more specialized. They are not, they're, they're focusing on particular areas of physics. And we have the Richard Institute, and, and the list goes on. And no data is, we would like Nodita to be a corresponding center uh, in, in, for the Nordic region. So we have activities. We run scientific programs. I'll talk more about those uh, later on. They, they are where we bring in uh, 20, 25 people at a time, usually for a month, up to two months. And they focus on a particular area. And those areas can be uh, not just uh, standard core areas of theoretical physics. We can actually we have programs in a very, very broad range of uh, theoretical natural science, you could say. And this, I think, is a way for the institute to be relevant and to engage with a much larger section of the uh, scientific community than we could through just the uh, efforts of our, of our own people. Here. And in those, all of these programs here, we have, as I said, we focus not exclusively, but we do uh, emphasize that to involve Nordic, the Nordic community, and I think this is, this is reasonable because that is the local environment here, and this is of course also the community that is supporting us. And then we, uh, in addition to running these maybe more outward directed uh, activities, we have uh, in-house research and in-house research training. We have a number of postdoctoral positions, and we also have PhD students here. Right. And then Finally, we have a tradition, Nodita has a long-standing tradition to run summer schools and winter schools, and we are continuing that uh, also here. Right. Let me very briefly run through the history of the Institute. So, it has been around since the late 50s. It started as the Nordic Institute for Theoretical Atomic Physics, so that's where the A comes from in our acronym. Um, and it was located at the Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen. And it was started actually as a, to compensate the Bohr Institute and, and Niels Bohr himself for losing the theory division of CERN, which was originally in Copenhagen, but was then moved to be closer to the experimental activities in Geneva. And the Nordic countries got together and decided to, to start an institute at that time. Uh, back in 1957, in the late 50s, the institute was quite different and it operated in a very different way from today. But it has had a long uh, history and quite, a, quite an impressive one for its size, I would say. And it has lived up to this notion of being flexible, what I, as I said in the beginning. It has, it has changed with the times and it has even, in some cases, moved ahead of the times and, and uh, spearheaded. And in particular, the scope has broadened beyond just atomic physics. And, uh, but the, the focus has always been on, on basic theoretical physics, and that remains today also. Even though in our program activities, we certainly do, and we like to cater to a broader range to both our experimental colleagues and also beyond uh, traditional physics, our basic uh, Theoretical physics is, is, is an institute of theoretical physics, uh, first and foremost, and that remains. Okay, now there were some changes in uh, uh, the political environment in the Nordic countries, the Nordic uh, collaboration. Basically, before, up until 2006, Nordita was 
owned and directly operated <coughs> by uh, the Nordic governments. There's an uh, uh, um, institution that's called the Nordic Council of Ministers that owned this institute and funded it directly in Copenhagen. Uh, they decided uh, in the sort of years leading up to 2006 to move out of the business for the most part of owning institutes and uh, wanted them to move to local to the local universities. And this was not just Nordita, there was a long list of these institutes and various subjects. Uh, and uh, while they would continue to support them, but at a reduced level. So at the moment, we are getting about 50% of the financial support uh, from the Nordic Council of Ministers as the institute used to get back in, in 2007. Uh, but after some, uh, uh, after some fairly complicated story. Uh, at the end of the day, the institute did not move to the University of Copenhagen, which would have been expected to be the most natural thing, but instead it was deemed uh, a better option to come here. And since 2007, Nordita uh, has been in Stockholm, hosted jointly by the university, Stockholm University and the Royal Institute of Technology. So the institute is no longer owned jointly by the Nordic countries. It is actually a is owned by these two universities, but there is a lot of, uh, uh, it remains Nordic in many ways. Uh, bulk of the funding comes from the Nordic countries. There's a Nordic board that takes, makes strategic decisions for the institute, and we will come to that a bit later on. Uh, it is located uh, in the Albanova University Center, which of course is here right next door. Uh, and uh, we are now getting our funding, as I said before, a lot of it comes from the Nordic Council of Ministers, roughly 50% of, of what, we, what we need for our operations comes from them, continues to come from there. But these, this is through four-year contracts. The current contract uh, is 2010 through 13. And beyond that, uh, well, that renewal is subject, of course, there will be an evaluation. But there, of course, can also be political shifts that can affect the future. So the future is, I would say, more uncertain now than it was in the old days in Copenhagen. But on the other hand, the history shows us that the future was also uncertain there. Um, okay. So let me move on here. Well, anyway, here's a picture of the, uh, we're now <coughs> in this building here. This is the main Nordita building, and this here is the Alpanova Center, which houses uh, most of physics and uh, well, parts of chemistry and uh, biological sciences for the, the, both Stockholm University and, and the Royal Institute. And if you then want to see, a, this is then on a larger scale, central Stockholm as well. Right. All right. Now, so what is it that we do? Well, we have researchers here. So the ma our main uh, uh, thing is that we have a number of both senior and junior researchers who work here full time and, and, and uh, we'll, um, we'll say more about that in, in a minute. Uh, but it is no longer just a, an institute of theoretical atomic physics. We are doing research both theoretical and computational in a, in a variety of uh, subjects. Uh, it's astrophysics, condensed matter physics, biological physics, statistical physics, complex systems, uh, subatomic physics, cosmology and gravitational theory, and there are cross uh, disciplinary projects between various things. Right. Good. And, um, but in addition to this research, now this is a small institute, and you'll see that I've put uh, the list. Basically, I can list all our staff here on one page, so it's not a large institute. But we are able to go beyond the uh, range of activities of this rather limited number of people by running what we call supplemental activities. The most important of these are these so-called scientific programs. These are programs uh, that I mentioned before, uh, where we focus on particular uh, problems or uh, extended period, usually a month, up to two months, uh, we get 
combination, usually it's about 20, 25 people come in at a time. Of those, there will be a core of internationally recognized leaders in the field from both, some of them can be from the Nordic countries, but also from anywhere in the world. Then we will, to anchor it in the Nordic community, we make sure there's usually uh, some fraction of uh, invited Nordic participants. Uh, these senior participants will bring with them some junior people usually, postdocs, even graduate students. And then these are open in the sense that people, anybody can apply to, to participate in a program. And there should be, a, and there is a, a method for them selecting if needed among the applicants. Okay. Uh, it is also, I'll, 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 let me postpone, uh, I'll say more about the programs in a minute. In addition to these uh, extended programs, we have shorter events like the uh, workshops. They can be two or three day affairs with just a handful of people, to being week long conferences with a couple hundred participants, anywhere in that range. And usually, for the larger events, we are not we are not alone. Then we usually are then co-sponsoring or co-organizing them with, with the other institutes here in the, in the neighborhood or, or in further field. Okay, and then. Last but not least, we have a visiting visitor program, and that's quite a, a, a vigorous program. We have, a, a, in addition to these programs and uh, um, and workshops, we also just have a steady stream of, of visitors, both short-term visits, and we have seminar speakers and the like, but also usually each year several more long-term. Those are usually senior uh, people who are here for from a month. So here's the research staff. Uh, so we have, there's the director, which is a time-limited position. I, I, will have, I will finish my three-year term this summer. I've been uh, invited by the board to stay another three-year period. Uh, and then the long-term, the senior people are here, the professors. And we, Axel Brandenburg came with the institute from uh, Copenhagen. Uh, Kostya Zarembo, who is sitting at the back of the hall here, he uh, joined us uh, last fall. Uh, John Hertz remained behind in, in Copenhagen, but he is uh, we, he, he is working for Nordita there. He is uh, we, we pay his salary, and he spends a significant part of his time here in, in Stockholm. Has ongoing collaborations here. And, um, Matthias Reinhardt is is. Uh, Temporary, uh, he's a visiting professor, has been, will be here for I think a total of two years. And he's part of the uh, ERC uh, advanced grant project that Axel Vandenberg is, is, is running. And you'll notice that this ERC project actually represents about a third of our staff right now. There are four PhD students, two postdocs, and uh, one assistant professor and a senior professor. So this has been a major, major, uh, major impact on. Especially astrophysics. Uh, now we're fortunate to have Paolo Di Vecchia and Chris Petek, uh, who have retired, both of them, are, but we are active here full, uh, full time. So Paolo spends most of his time here in Stockholm. Chris, on the other hand, is, is based in Copenhagen. So what does NN mean? Can you explain to Ah, <laughs> good. Very important. There is uh, the plans for setting up the institute in, in uh, Stockholm. They call for having a total of three senior people here, and they were to be recruited. Well, Axel came with the institute, and the other two were to be recruited more or less in step with the retirements of the people in, in Copenhagen. And uh, so we already have Zarembo in place, but we advertised last fall, uh, with a deadline last fall, uh, a position in kinetic matter theory. And uh, we are in the final stages, I hope, of, of completing that recruitment. We have, uh, there were 64 applications were received, and those have been evaluated, and there were interviews held. And uh, is a, because these positions here, by the way, are not, they are professorships, but they are professorships at one of the local universities here, either Stockholm University, Royal Institute, or actually Uppsala University is also a possibility for these positions. So that makes the appointment procedure a little bit convoluted. But at the end of the day, each, each of these professors will select one of these universities to be their 
own institution, if you like, and then they are on leave from that institution to work at Nordita uh, indefinitely. And so we are now, so there's also, that means, so there's a special appointment committee which Nordita has a lot of representation on, but also the East the University. That committee has met uh, during the spring. They have selected a candidate, and this is uh, uh, Alexander Balatsky of uh, the Los Alamos National Lab in, in the U.S. He's actually arriving here in Stockholm tomorrow to, to meet with us and, and meet with the uh, president of the university. So uh, I will try to arrange for him to meet with you also. Okay. So the idea is that he would uh, either Balatsky or, or well, well, let's assume it's Balatsky. We'll start here. It's probably optimistic that he'll be starting in 2011, but early 2012. John Hurst? Well, that's the last case. Okay. Well, the thing is, because of the 50% reduction in uh, um, sort of, I, I hesitate to say guaranteed, but the long term funding that's mm -hmm. stable, mm -hmm. uh, it's imprudent to reduce the number of the senior people. They used to be five or six in Copenhagen. So we cannot replace them one by you know, one on one. But I think, partly based on recommendation from this committee, uh, it was decided to do start the recruitments a little bit ahead of time to get some overlap. And so, uh, whether you view Balatsky or whoever we managed to recruit as a replacement for John Hertz or for Chris Patek or for Alan Luther, who retired some years ago, uh, is a bit of a matter of, well, it's not so clear. Um, Okay. Then we have, as was also the case in, in, in Copenhagen, there were temporary positions. They were called assistant professors. I believe there were three plus three year appointments there. Here they are just five year fixed term appointments. And uh, we have five of them on the Nodita budget, and then the ERC uh, grant also pays for one of these positions now. Uh, and we've filled those positions. In fact, Already one of our first uh, assistant professors, uh, Stefan Hoffmann, has already been offered and has taken up a, a tenured position in Germany at, in Munich. And this is, of course, uh, what these positions have traditionally been about. These are opportunities for researchers to come and uh, spend a, 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 an extended time, but a finite time at, at Nordita and do good, good work. And, and basically then move on to regular senior positions. And this, uh, at least we, we can now see that this, this uh, can also work here. Uh, then we have one of our former fellows, in fact, yes, sir, he sits right there now. He's the question. Sabine, uh, I wonder if he's in the report with gravitational physics. That's my chance to find it. Well, okay, that's because I cannibalized this thing from, uh, <laughs> um, she is sort of on the border between the some of her work has been on, on black holes pro provided in colliders. Is that high energy physics or is it gravitational physics? So, she is also on parental leave now, which there is no business. Well, she is here right now. For a month, I think, but uh, she had twins back in December. So, the Anipati Matikan is also on the ground. Um, okay, now we have this notion of corresponding fellows. Uh, these are uh, people who are employed elsewhere, but for various reasons have, want to have a close connection to us, uh, will come as regular visitors, and uh, basically, when a corresponding fellow is here at the Institute, they are part of the faculty, they, will, they are invited to faculty meetings and, and they can propose uh, workshops and the like, like our faculty. And the, this was a category that, that the Institute had in, in Copenhagen and has been revived here. And our first corresponding fellow, as I say, is Yasu Rudi, who used to be a Nodita fellow, postdoctoral fellow, but is now working in Trondheim at the uh, Havli Institute for uh, neuroscience. neuroscience, right? And. Uh, happens to be here uh, today. But, um, 
Then we have our Lolita Fellows. These are two-year positions. At the moment, we have 11 uh, postdoctoral positions that are funded by the, by the Institute, and then there are some like two more that are on the UFC panel. And you will see presentations by six, five fellows tomorrow, and then George Ahmed is also giving one of the presentations tomorrow. All right. Now we have PhD students. Now the, the basic Modita funding does not cover PhD students, but uh, we have, so all of these are based on grants. Four of them are in, in with the ERC grant. I have a PhD student here who's funded by a grant from, from the Research Council in Iceland. And uh, we have here a student who is uh, being co-supervised by Jani Petri Matikainen grant from the Swedish Research Council, and then Eddie Ardon has just selected a student. He also has a grant from the Swedish Research Council for a PhD student studying, studying basically now. Okay. Now, let me just very quickly now go through some of these uh, deliverables. Now, for the in-house research, uh, we, uh, I will show you some data on, on basically we, we, we post all the papers that are produced at the Institute on an archive, and so we can follow back actually years sort of the, at least the volume of production and then quality is, is harder to, 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 to gauge but um, in, in the overwhelming majority of the papers that are posted to this archive they will are then, then subsequently published in, in referee journals some of them in, in referee conference proceedings uh, but these are sort of the areas that we're mostly focusing on these days now, in the scientific programs, uh, as I mentioned before, they cover a very wide range of topics. We are running them now at the level of, the, the average for the last four years now has been eight months a year. And we seem to be able to handle that reasonably well. But if we try to do much more than that, we start running into scheduling problems. And there is Christmas and summer vacation and the like Easter. Um, and these are usually about one month or two months, and the typical length of stay is, is shorter than we would like. The, the, the median is somewhere between one and two weeks. We would like that to be a longer, longer period, I think. Then we, I mentioned, uh, well, each of these programs, most of them actually have some sort of workshop associated with them as a focus event. But in, in addition to that, we organize somewhere between five and seven, or we are involved in the organization of, we don't organize this. All of them single handedly. And then, for the winter and summer schools, we have started what I hope will be a, a, a long tradition is the Notita Winter School on theoretical physics. We have had two rounds so far. We, we rotate the topics. The first one was on astrophysical dynamo theory. We had then one this winter on, on condensed matter physics, frontiers in condensed matter physics. And then the next year school, Paolo and Trolls are organizing on uh, this is. Particle physics, sort of standard, standard model and beyond. And uh, then, in, in addition to this, we would like to have the, maybe one summer school, that would not necessarily be organized here. But, uh, those, will be, those are more irregular. Uh, and then, we also have a, a summer school every other year for more junior, for actually for undergraduates who are uh, just beginning to get seriously interested in physics. And then we try to have a one-week school where they have the opportunity to see some uh, lectures by, by active researchers. Okay, and then we have the visitor program. Let me show you some data on all of these things. This is our, the number of papers in our preprint archive, and you can sort of read our history a little bit there. This starts in 95, and uh, the level was pretty stable here, sort of around 70, 80 papers per year. Uh, now, some of these are written by our visitors, that's true, but most of these papers are written by my in-house staff. And uh, then there was a, a little bit of a spike here in 2000, I'm not quite sure why that is, but uh, I guess it's fluctuations in relatively small numbers. But, but then, of course, you see a big dip here when the Institute was moved. This is 2006 and seven, which is the years when it was set up. But you'll see that we are recovering from that quite quickly. And, we had promised uh, to go beyond 100 papers per year in some, before some, uh, I think as part of the contract, the, the, uh, 
there were certain goals set for the institute and the contract with, with the Council of Ministers, and we were going to surpass 100 papers in our archive next year. And we already did it last year, so I think we're, we can be happy with the volume at least. And now, of course, the question is whether somebody reads all these papers, is mm -hmm. something we should have power to uh, document. All right, so these are the uh, preprint. And now, another thing, of course, to take into account here, uh, you should, of course, renormalize these or normalize these things by um, the size of the institute. The institute over here actually had more people working at it than, than the institute does over here. And both more postdocs and more senior people over here. The but year of rise, does it correspond to increasing people in, since 2007? I, I believe so. Uh, now, of course, I, 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 I hesitate to extrapolate this. But I, I, I would expect it to level off. In fact, indications this year are that it was going to be quite comparable to last year. Now, there's some of this, of course, is because of the program activity. There's some. Uh, there's a fraction of these papers here were uh, submitted to the archive by people. It's work that was done at a program, not by noted uh, uh, scientists. Uh, so, so, anyway, we shouldn't be too much into these numbers, but I think it's encouraging at least the uh, the sign of the derivative here. Okay. Now, this is a bit of a busy slide, and, and uh, the best to give you an impression, this is basically a list of the programs this year and next year. And uh, we already have a list for most of 2013, but I, I didn't think of that. Here. And maybe the thing to take away from this is, first of all, that we are running quite a number of programs. And, but secondly, that there's quite a variety here in, in the sort of things that these programs are about. We have, this is a program on cosmology, then we move to uh, network theory and complex systems. Uh, the predictability is, is a combination of, uh, uh, well, it's, it's actually astrophysics and meteoro meteorology. Uh, then it's string theory, then we go back to uh, dynamo theory, and then time-dependent processes in, in, in quantum physics. This is actually uh, an experimental group here at Stockholm University that's sponsoring this. Uh, then we go to more statistical mechanics and, and biophysics here, back to string theory. So you see, it's, 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 it's quite a broad quite a range. Um, you will also see that, of course, no data people are quite prominent among the organizers. That's a natural thing because, uh, we've, first of all, we encourage all our faculty to propose programs. And also, when external groups are interested in, in having programs here, they often try to hook up with the local person just to make things work more smoothly in terms of the actual organization of the, of the program. Okay, I'll give you a little bit of statistics here on the, uh, so who's actually coming to these things. So here's for the programs. This is, we have a, a database of visitors. That, so we got, came online more or less in spring 2009. So that's as far back as we can go. And uh, we, I took it through the end of last year. And you'll see uh, things which are perhaps not so surprising. 40% of the program participants, roughly, is from the Nordic countries. Uh, and of that, there's a large concentration from Sweden. This is, of course, because it's convenient for local scientists here to actually sign up for programs to get the information about them. So it's not that we are flying in or, or, or bringing in on the train all these people here. A lot of them are already here. Interacting with the programs here, but it does also show that uh, the, this activity is is uh, has an impact on the on the, on the local environment here. I think that's clear. Um, and then you see that there is again not perhaps not surprising that there's a significant chunk that comes from Europe. Uh, from, from the, uh, this is mostly well U.S. And, and Canada here, and then. We also do have participants coming from Japan, from China, quite far afield. So this is the programs. And I forgot to put in here, but the total number of participants in here, I believe, was some about just under 700. That we're talking about. This, is, this, is, so this is programs for uh, almost, almost uh, we've got 12 programs I believe, that we have included in here. Then we have workshop part participants. Those are basically things which are not 
Fluxel programs. And the distribution is, is similar, but you'll notice, for example, the Sweden is, is less represented here, but that's partly because these, are, these workshops tend to have more people coming in, so the local, uh, locals don't figure quite as prominently in the numbers. But again, this is, and this is, uh, I think, again, a comparable number, that, or maybe slightly more, actually, than we are talking about here. And then we have the regular um, scientific visits. So that's not just sort of the uh, And here we're also talking about uh, a couple of hundred people in this period. So this is actually quite a large program. 150, I think, sorry. And you'll see that there the Nordic countries are now the, the Sweden does not show up so prominently because when we have visitors coming locally, we, they, they don't even make it into the database. Okay, let me just wrap up here in a few, few words about how things were set up here. So we have a board that is, board members that come from each of the Nordic countries, so the, the five Nordic countries, uh, and then there's a chairperson. Now, these board members, and I, I guess this is important for how the institute works, that it is actually quite independent. It's owned by the universities, but they have taken very much a hands-off approach, and they let us run our, our show uh, very much. So they are nominated by the research councils in their individual countries, but then they are, but the decision, of course, appointment is made by the, by the universities. And the board does the sort of thing that boards do, they set the policy and they, uh, oversee the, uh, the budget and then how we can spend our, our funding. They also decide on which positions get announced and on they have the final word on all the appointments except for these professorships that I talked about before because that's a more complicated story with the universities being involved. Although Nodita actually nominates a majority of the appointment committee. And that's, that's quite important. They also uh, nominate the uh, director was then uh, joined. Uh, so basically the board selects uh, the director. And uh, well, then we have a scientific advisory committee. And we, but we also have uh, advice and input from some Nordic committees. And mostly what they do is they help us uh, deal with the application we get for uh, postdocs and, 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 and the positions. Now I didn't go through that, but another sign that the institute is its way to being settled here is that the number of applications for our postdoctoral fellowships have been growing quite rapidly. Um, three years ago we had 150 applications. The year after that they were 350. Last season they were over 400. Uh, this growth, and at the same time the number of Nordic applicants has stayed roughly constant. In, in this. So you could say that the fraction of applicants coming from the Nordic countries is getting smaller. Uh, if you then look at the uh, fellows themselves, the ones that we actually recruit, there is a bias in that we seem to be better able to attract people that are, have some connection already with the Nordic countries. So if you look at those of our fellows who are either Nordic citizens, who have PhDs from the Nordic countries, or have previously been employed in the Nordic countries, that is roughly half of the fellows. That has happened without any special measures that so that I would say the when we are making these appointments, they are scientific quality is, is, is absolutely the overriding one. And then obviously we also want to have a spread of people in different, all the different fields so that, that comes in also. And this is done in collaboration with these, these research committees, but the it's the faculty and the director that decide on the appointments at the end of the day and then subject to approval by the board. All right, I think I will spare you then any discussion of our finances. For now we can go into that during some discussion sessions. I have a couple of slides here, which I more or less expected not to get to. But um, let me though show you here. Here is our, uh, this is the current Nobita board. And you'll be seeing uh, some, but not all of them uh, tomorrow and later today. And so there is one from each. each Country, and there's also a reserve member, and usually the reserve members are called to board meetings also. 
And this, of course, is also a group of, of active scientists which we can, whose expertise we draw. We have a fairly small, in fact, you may even say very small administrative staff. We have the chief administrator, Danny Evan, who's sitting right there. We have in a 75% position a system manager. We have uh, Hans, who does web and uh, computing support. He's uh, at the back of the room. Helen Keeter, he helps us out a lot in Copenhagen, although she is being employed by the new school. She was the chief administrator of the institute in, in Copenhagen. And then we have Anne Gita, who's an administrator here. Now, of course, when we are starting programs or, or we have a lot of things going on, this is not enough. And then we do have a group of very good assistants who are master students here at the universities and, and in physics, and they, have, they help us a lot. Okay. Well, I think I'll just leave this slide on. This gives you an idea of what we use the funding for. I can certainly answer questions, and we can go into it some later stage. But I think it's a good idea if we uh, uh, let us stop here and uh, make way for the uh, presentation of the groups. By, by, by. But if you have quick questions, I tell them what's happening. So for scientific programs, do you have any means of evaluating the feedback from the participants and things like that? Yes. We do that. We have uh, actually we developed now online surveys that are sent. And this was a huge improvement over the paper forms. We used to distribute paper forms to our participants, which they would then lose before they had to put them in. Now, at the end of each program, shortly afterwards, everybody gets sent a, a fairly quick online survey, and we can show you samples of, of, of feedback that we've gotten from recent programs. We, we ask some general questions about what they thought of the scientific content, but also of the, uh, the moment. How things are working in general. So that's been quite useful to get that. I, I also did not go into details about it, but we also have a, a procedure for selecting which programs are run. We have a, a program committee, which is international. And so we, there's a call for propos proposals. It's a fairly simple proposal that people, and there are but I hope are clear guidelines for what people should put into those proposals. They are then sent to a, a committee which evaluates them and uh, makes a ranking and recommendation to the, but the decision is, is then with the moment of order. And this is a process that takes about two or three months. Uh, to go but the, the proposals are due in December and we usually have a decision by February. So, so has the reaction been positive to the way the programs are organized? Um, I think so, yes, we've had, you know, what, why do people choose to stay for such short times? Uh, well, my guess is that it's, partly it's pressures from, from other parts of their life. Maybe it's also partly because we let them, and there's nothing hard-nosed about insisting on longer stays. Um, I would imagine it's a combination of I imagine put on the stage would be red salad and fire salad. So Certainly if it was going to be more than, if we were going to cut them in months. Yeah. And that we're not able to do. Do you have any way of monitoring the relative success of the programs by counting publications or any, any other way? Uh, well, one way is, of course, highly subjective way is, of course, these surveys. Mm -hmm. At least we will know whether the participants felt it was a success. Then we can keep track of, um, but it varies a lot between the organizers. Some organizers impress on their participants to use the Nodita archive, for example, to, as a, as to, to, to put their papers there. So it's not, it's hard to compare between programs. Um, another thing which is kind of hard to maybe follow, but maybe one should be able to do it some ways to look for acknowledgement sections in papers. Because we do ask people if, if they feel that this, the stay here was important to, to the development of some work that would be mentioned. But it's only if a very significant part of it was done that we ask people, we suggest to people that they put it on the archive or, or even include a joint signation, which, which they can if they wish. I'm 
but I think it would be very interesting if we could figure out a way to go back, for example, a year after and see, maybe get back, and then with this online capability, I guess, at, at, the, at the risk of annoying our customers, we could go back after a year and, and ask them to assess again whether this had been a success. Yeah, I, I know that some of the new Institute, for example, can be useful. The danger is, of course, the scientific program is, is just a series of workshops if you put such short participation. This is true. And uh, I think also there's a further danger that if you have a group, a group of organizers, they may even split that short period up into even shorter. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we need to be on our toes to uh, discourage. Okay, so I think we'll then move on to the next item.